All right, welcome back to another vid. The Friday brew, but not on a Friday. The delayed brew at the start of a week. Crazy. So I was just busy last week, and I really wanted to get the vid out, but I couldn't find the time to record it. So I'm doing it now. So it is delayed, but at least I'm kind of still doing one every couple of weeks, kind of. So yeah, a few topics to talk about, not too many. I think maybe going forward, what I should really make a conscious effort in doing is making these vlogs or brews a little bit shorter because I think, what have I done now, six or seven? And I think maybe four of them, maybe five, have been pushed in two hours. It's a long time. Um, I mean, if I've got stuff to talk about, then fine, there'll be two hours. But I think maybe an hour, an hour and a bit maybe, I think that's kind of my aim. If I try and get them to half the, that two hours, so an hour, um, that's probably a good idea, I think, going forward. But we'll see, it is what it is. There's always a the timestamps in the description box. So that's the good thing about those. That's why I put them there, because not everybody wants to listen to everything you say. So um, I guess it doesn't matter, does it, if it's two hours, really, just use the timestamps. So yeah, a few things to talk about. The first thing, now I wasn't gonna mention this, I wasn't going to, but it's funny. It is funny, so I thought I'd share it. So I'm gonna talk about it, share it, show you a few uh, pictures, kind of, like screen grabs, really. And, um, and then we'll move on. I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm not really going to bring it up in the future. Not often, maybe once in a blue moon. But it is funny. So you'll know in, it was like my previous vid or the one before that, uh, like a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the fact, at least I think I did, that I was stupid enough to reply to someone's comments uh, and on someone else's vid. That's the thing. It wasn't even on my video. And of course, when you do that on the internet, on YouTube, uh, people don't like that and you get hit with dislikes and all that kind of stuff and silly comments and blah 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 so I didn't really get any silly comments apart from the brief, very brief exchange that I had with this person I think in fact I just replied once uh, that's as far as it went but then I received a load of dislikes on my vid and I did touch upon that actually I uh, think about it yeah a couple of vids back I think and um, but it, it went on it, it went it got a little bit out of control but it's funny so I thought I'd show you so if you look at the first picture that you see on the screen now and you can see last year, in its entirety of 2017, 30 dislikes across all my vids. Well, that's normal. In fact, I think that's really good for someone who's been around a long time, who's got a fair amount, or I mean a small amount, but a fair amount of subscribers and a decent amount of views, 30 dislikes. That, that kind of backs up what I said a couple of vids back where I said that I hardly ever get any dislikes. It's kind of changed now uh, for, a, for a bit at least. So 30 in the entire year, really good. I'd rather not get any, who would? But okay, fine, only 30, not a problem. Now look at the last 28 days, or at least from the 8th of March to the 4th of April, 644, just in that week. I mean, how or 28 days, how absolutely pointless is that? But check this out. So from 644 dislikes in the last month, 641 of them, as you can see, are from non-subscribers. And then it gets even funnier, on the 3rd of April, 625 dislikes arrived on one day. I mean, really, it's absolutely pathetic. The only reason I kind of found this, well, two reasons. One, because I noticed, as I touched upon, uh, a few dislikes had started to appear on the last couple of vids I made. And when I say a few, it was like six and seven. That was really unusual for me, really unusual. So I thought something strange was going on. And then I had some old comments on, or some new comments, I guess, on some old vids. It always makes me laugh how people do that. I mean, it's nice, you know, it just shows that when you put a video out, it's out there forever and people can watch it whenever they like. So yeah, I got an email notification that someone had left a comment. They were positive comments, nothing silly. And of course I clicked on the link to respond to those comments and you can see that they had a few dislikes. And I was like, well, that didn't have any last time I looked and now there's like five or six and there wasn't any. So just out of curiosity, I went into the analytics and everyone should do that every now and again, just for a laugh, because there's so much information there. Uh, it tells you the, the geography of where people are, uh, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's pretty telling stuff. And so I had a look, because I was curious, and that's when I brought up these stats of 30 dislikes last year, 644 from the 8th of March to the 4th of April, and like I say, 625 of those arriving on one day. Now what this will be is one individual, pretty certain of that, on that one day, one individual, probably that person who I had an exchange with, 
uh, or because they commented about me, amongst other people and other things, on someone else's vid. And I've never even heard of them before. Didn't, I don't know who they are. No vids on their channel, obviously. And what they would have done uh, is basically downloaded one of those kind of bot programs. You put in the amount of dislikes you want that channel to have. And then what that program does is it kind of distributes them throughout that person's videos on their channel. So what it isn't, I'd be very shocked, is that one person going through with multiple accounts on every single vid and disliking it, because that would take hours upon hours. So that's what that person has done. They've um, basically just downloaded one of those programs to distribute uh, dislikes on people's vids. So if you're watching, cheers, mate. Thank you very much. That was a really nice thing to do. Absolutely bizarre. I don't know why people do it. Uh, I can only presume it's jealousy because they want what we do. They want to make videos. Well, why don't you do it then? Is it because you, you don't have the confidence? Well, get the confidence. Making videos is really easy. It's very simple. You know, if you want to interact with the community, then leave positive comments. Be nice. Why be an idiot? I know it's naive in this day and age especially, but why be an idiot? Why do that? I don't get it. So, um, yeah, going forward, what I may do, and I don't want to do it, but what I may have to do, if the dislikes kind of continue, and it's only a few every vid, or has been, so it's not like hundreds or anything yet, um, but yeah, if it kind of gets out of hand, or at least from my perspective, I may just disable the ratings. And it's a shame to do that, because um, it looks bad, doesn't it? I mean, I'll speak for myself, but when I sometimes click on other people's vids, and they have got the uh, likes and dislikes disabled, so you can't do it, the first thing I think, is, oh, obviously you must be getting a lot of dislikes. The first thing that crosses my mind. Um, and it just looks, it's a shame people have got to do that. But if they leave their dislikes up and they get a lot, then that looks bad too. So it, you, can, you can clearly tell they're being targeted. So what do you do? You're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. So if, yeah, but if it gets really out of hand, um, then that's what I'll do. I'll disable the ratings, but I can cope with a few here and there. That's not a problem. But just in case you happen to be curious, as to why you were seeing them and you never used to, well, that's the story. It's one person on the 3rd, specifically on the 3rd of April, 625 times disliked all my vids. What is the point? Seriously. But we move on. We move on. It's funny. You've got to admit, it is pretty funny. Although you can also admit and will that it's, it's weird and just pointless. Just be nice. Just be nice to people. I don't get it. So, um... Yeah, I've wrote down on my notes here, um, I say notes, kind of bullet points for things to talk about, football vid. What I may do, or I may not, it, speaking of dislikes, I'm a football vid, but they're never popular, um, because it's that kind of tribal uh, mentality. I get it, it's more understandable on football, because you've got your team and you stick to it and all that kind of stuff. It, I, I wouldn't do it, but I guess, or I get why people do it. But yeah, I may make a football vid, I may not. Um, City losing to United yesterday in the derby in spectacular fashion. And part of me wants to talk about it briefly, like 10 minutes or something. Uh, the other part of me thinks, just move on. Again, just forget about it and move on. So we'll see. But speaking of YouTube, one of the things that I have seen or heard of, and I've only watched one video, and apparently what YouTube have brought in, and this may have been brought in quite a while ago, actually, and it makes sense, because I have wondered this, is apparently if you, let's say you're subscribed to someone, in fact let's say you're subscribed to me and you don't for whatever reason watch maybe three or four vids of mine that I upload, maybe a football vid, maybe you're uninterested in it, maybe I do like a like game player or a games X magazine or a diary vid, whatever it is, but let's just say you don't watch a few or you just you get a little bit bored of watching my stuff, impossible right, but let's just say you do, one of the things that YouTube appear to have brought in is that if you don't watch a few vids in a row from that person then those vids start to not appear in your subscriber feed. I've definitely seen that, definitely. There's been occasions where I've went into my subscriptions, it's listed everyone who's obviously uploaded a vid within the last few days or last week or two or whatever it is. And I'll have a quick skim through to see if there's anything I kind of want to prioritise watching and I'll not really see anything. But you know on the right hand side, and you may see it now, depending on your layout of your screen, whether you watch on the TV, a computer or a tablet or a phone or whatever, uh, you get the recommended vids. And so what I've seen is a video from someone I'm subscribed to, which is a new vid, which isn't in my feed. And I've thought, well, what the hell's all that about? And I just kind of put it down to it being a bit of a glitch. But it's clearly not a glitch. It's something that YouTube are deliberately doing. 
So um, that kind of makes sense to a degree because YouTube also has that kind of bell icon. And if you click on that, I think that's supposed to give you uh, email notifications that that person has uploaded vids. So yeah, so I guess more than ever, I mean, do it if you want, I don't care. I don't do it for anyone, I've got to be honest. Uh, I just, whatever, if I miss a vid, I miss a vid. I'm sure I'll catch up with it another time. But if you really want to see my vids or anybody else's vid, then I think you're meant to click on that bell icon, so to speak, and then you get a notification. Because as I say, if you don't, and then you don't watch a few of their vids, they start to not appear in your feed, which is a little bit poor, a little bit sneaky, and maybe just another way, another way for YouTube to really promote the big channels. You know, don't watch the smaller ones. We're going to try and cut those out a little bit. And uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. You know, if you're subscribed to someone, then it doesn't necessarily mean you want to watch every single vid they upload. So don't make it, don't put it like a, an algorithm or a system where you miss people's vids just because you haven't watched two, three or four in a row. That's, that's not very fair. So the next thing I want to talk about are digital games. Now, I have talked about this before, how I'm happy to go digital this generation and uh, the convenience is amazing. Just download it, it's on your dashboard, press a button and you're playing. You don't have to get a disc out, take it off the shelf, put it in, sit back and then you, none of that, it's just instantly there. And whilst that is true and it's super convenient, I discovered recently that the grass isn't always greener on the other side. Because with our ISP, Internet Service Provider, which is Suddenlink, and we've meet, been with them for the best part of 10 years or whatever it is. I don't know if it's Suddenlink an American thing or is it a British thing as well? No clue. But anyway, been with them for the best part of a decade and I had the odd issue here and there, but generally speaking, yeah, they're just meh, you know, same old, like any other internet service provider, you know, they'll have the good moments, they'll have the annoying moments, but generally speaking, they seem to do all right. But what we don't have is an unlimited package because we've never had the need for it. Now by unlimited, what I mean is you can download anything in terms of the size. We've kind of ultimately were capped at a level and I was stung the other day because what I decided to do, well I said the other day, it's probably like two or three weeks back, I decided to re-download all across the space of like 48 hours or something, uh, 72 hours, re-download everything that I'd purchased, which I'd originally deleted off my PlayStation, but I wanted to kind of put them back on essentially, um, because if I ever felt the need to play those games, I could play them at the click of a button rather than to having to re-download them because that can take a while. So I thought overnight I'll just re-download a load of games, put them all in a queue, the best part of 50. And some of these are big games, they're not all indie games, they're big games, like gigabyte upon gigabyte. And it took hours upon hours upon hours to download all this stuff. But I didn't know that there was a cap, I was naive, I didn't know. So what happened is that when the bill came through for the, uh, well, the monthly bill, it was substantially higher, and I mean substantially higher than I was expecting, <laughs> and I couldn't believe it nearly fell off my chair. The first thing I did was got on the phone straight away, talked to whoever picked it up, of course, and they were just like, I mean, I felt sorry for them because I was irate and they were just doing their job. It's not their fault. So, and they couldn't really help me out. I was like, right, put your supervisor on. Supervisor comes on and they were useless, absolutely useless. Um, basically, the long story short is every single time you go over your limits, uh, by a certain amount, they will send you suddenly, they'll send you an email. They don't send you a letter, they don't call you, they send you an email, right? And it's a warning, it says, right, you've gone over your limit, and uh, as a result, it'll be $15 extra charge. Now, what had happened is I'd gone over many times, so they'd sent quite a few emails, but I didn't check, because it was my wife's email address that I'd set up with, and she doesn't really check her email that often, um, at least at that address. So we didn't see these notifications coming through. So to be fair, they had warned us, not about all the charges, but about some, they'd given us like eight emails. And each email is $15 extra. And there was a few more on top of that, like I say, uh, extra charges, which they didn't notify us about. And that was my main gripe. It's like, okay, hands up, you know, you did send the email, we didn't check the email, fine. So I don't mind paying eight times $15. I don't want to, I didn't know about this overage. Um, you should really have called, but fine, I don't mind that. But they wanted to charge for a few more, which they hadn't notified me about. And so the supervisor was just having none of it, and I was having none of it. So I was, I was going full off on it, really was. Um, I was really annoyed. And in the end, I just, I just put the phone down. 
halfway through the sentence told her what I thought of her, um, not of her personally, <laughs> of her company and the phone just went down. I was, I was absolutely livid. Um, I just would have thought for being a customer for 10 years that they could have been a little bit more helpful, quite frankly. And I know for a fact that with her being a supervisor, what she could do is she could have taken some of that money off as a goodwill gesture. Because even in my job, you know, even though I'm not a manager, I do have that ability to take, and maybe you do in your job as well, or have done in the past. Maybe you shouldn't really do it, but you can do it. No one's going to know. You can write it off. There's all sorts of ways of doing it. And so I know she could, but a bit of a job's worth, everything by the book. And I, just, I wasn't impressed at all. It was just, it was poor. So, but anyway, the point is, I didn't know we, we didn't have this um, unlimited package. So we're going to have to get that going forward. But because we don't have it now, what it means is I've really got to watch what I download. Now, the odd game here and there isn't a problem, but obviously downloading 50-odd PlayStation 4 games, many of them um, gigabyte upon gigabyte, is a problem. So it made me think, do you know what? Not just does it take bloody ages, number one, to download a lot of games, or to download, download one game sometimes, especially if it's like a full-price game. It can be hours, potentially. So not just is that annoying. Uh, I'm also getting charged extra, and I don't want to be worrying. Am I close to my allotted limit? of downloadable space this month. So I've kind of come full circle a little bit. And whilst I will still download some games, of course I will, because especially when there's sales, there's some of the sales are amazing. I don't think people quite realize how cheap some of the games are, but it's made me think, do you know what? Um, for where we're at at this moment in time, for download speeds and for uh, caps on your internet service provider and all that kind of stuff, maybe for now, 2018, it's best to prioritize physical games. Maybe I'll do that. With the occasional digital game, if the price is really, really good. I mean, really good. Because there's one I bought, um, this is a couple of weeks ago, before the bill came through. Um, and I'll talk about it in a bit. A game I bought digitally. And the reason I didn't really buy it physically is because the physical version was like $15 more. And I just thought, what's the point of that? I'm getting the game. I can say $15. But maybe going forward, I don't mind paying a little bit more and getting the physical uh, copy and it's nothing really to do with the fact that I could put it on the shelf and appreciate the artwork and all the other kind of cliches most of which if not all are true of course but we, we do talk about the artwork and all that kind of stuff does it really matter I just think we just want something physical to show for our money uh, and each to their own of course for me when it comes to old retro games and I've got one to show you in a bit uh, which I think may have been on a pickup vid in the past but I've been playing it so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about uh, when it comes to the old retro stuff I love that. It's nostalgic. So because it's nostalgic, I want the physical copy. But of course, modern games aren't nostalgic because that's the definition of nostalgia, isn't it, really? It's, it's of a bygone era. So you can't get nostalgia for something which is relevant and current. In years to come, you can get nostalgic for it, I guess. Um, but yes, I'm not nostalgic for modern stuff, of course. So I don't feel the need to buy the cases and the boxes that have the physical version. But because of this internet caper, I think I may have to go back and prioritise. So I know a lot of you uh, will probably love that, even though it doesn't affect you in a way. Um, you don't care, it's, it's not your money, but part of you will be like, well, you know, good. Another person buying physical, long, long live physical media and all the rest of it. So fine, fair enough. So I've kind of given in a little bit there and I'm going back to physical, but not 100%, not 100%. And then maybe once, say, the PlayStation 5 comes out or the next Xbox or whatever else in the future, if the download speeds are really sped up big time, and if it's not going to be a problem downloading, you know, unlimited amounts of data, then maybe I'll go digital, and maybe even full on digital, further down the line. But yeah, for now, I'm reeling it back a little bit, and we're going to prioritise the physical stuff. So fair enough, hands up, you win, whatever. <laughs> it's come full circle. So, um, so that's that. Moving on to what I've been playing recently, and the first one is that aforementioned digital game. It's Sherlock Holmes, The Devil's Daughter. Now, I picked this up for, I think it was $13.99, maybe $14.99. So let's just say $15. That's around about 11 quid. Now, before I downloaded it, now I do this all the time. I'm not blinded towards just buying digital. What I will still do, even though digital has been my preference, maybe not now, um, at least for now, uh, what I'll usually do, always do, is I'll go on, say, Amazon, I'll go on to eBay, and I'll just look out of curiosity as to how much the physical version is. Because I'm not an idiot. You know, I wouldn't just prioritise digital because it's digital. If it's more expensive, then I'll go physical. 
And so I looked at The Devil's Daughter, I checked on Amazon, and I think at the time of looking, two or three weeks back, it was the best part of $30. Uh, yeah, that was used as well. Used copy, $30. And on eBay, a little bit cheaper, probably get one for maybe $25, $26. But I just kind of looked at it and I thought, well, $14, $15, I'd be paying $10 more. It's not a lot of money, quite frankly. But if you start doing that for every single game, it adds up. And I just thought, yeah, let's just download it. And of course, this was before the whole kind of going over my limit uh, with the, the downloads and stuff. So I wasn't really thinking straight, quite frankly. It was, oh, let's just get the digital version. So in hindsight, maybe I should have just paid the $10 more. But irrespective of that, it's, yeah, it's a really good game, actually. It's essentially a point and click, but a modern version of it. Uh, there's not a lot of gameplay to it. There's a certain amount of free roaming that you can do, which is nice, like walking around the cobbled streets in, essentially, Victorian London, which I love. And it was one of the reasons why I absolutely loved Assassin's Creed Syndicate, walking around in London in that era, and the detail of the shops, and the conversations that people have, and the things to do. I just, I absolutely love that game. I think it's brilliant. I mean, the controls are still a little bit clunky in Assassin's Creed, um, but the, the game, the, the environment, absolutely love it. When the rain's coming down, it looks brilliant. So that was one of the main attractions to get in this game. I love the setting of Victorian London. So that's really nice, the cobbled streets, the houses, um, the scene, the, the, the era it's setting is really good. But there's not really a great deal of gameplay per se. You know, yeah, you can walk around to a degree. It's not free roaming, not, not fully, not like an Assassin's Creed, not like a Grand Theft Auto. There's a lot of kind of fast traveling, uh, traveling involved, which I guess you can do in, in the other games as well. Um, but there's more of an emphasis on this one. And uh, yeah, it's just a detective game. Um, using your your brain, quite frankly, using this particular item on that item to unlock something, to uncover a clue, and ultimately to try and interrogate people um, and uh, yeah, get the the, the, uh, the people who committed the crimes brought to justice. I guess that's the ultimate aim. So it's quite slow paced. So if you're not into those kind of games, then it may not be for you. It's obviously not action driven. But I really like it. I'm having fun with it. And then second up. I've got a physical game to show you here, and it's this one. It's Wings of Death. Check out the artwork. So yeah, I see what people mean actually about the artwork. It is really good. It's really weird and quite spooky. But yeah, Wings of Death, and this one is on the Atari ST. The, um, the Amiga version is exactly the same. And this is a bit of a tip. I may have mentioned this recently, but a, a bit of a tip if you collect or buy for the Commodore Amiga, especially for the Amiga, because usually, but not exclusively, usually the Atari ST versions are cheaper so my little advice, or at least this is what I'm doing with my Amiga as well, I'm tending to buy the Atari ST version, generally, because it's cheaper. And what I'll then do is, well, firstly, then I've got the Atari ST version to play on my ST, but then I'll also copy the ROM for the Amiga version onto a blank disc, put that blank disc for the Amiga into the ST box, and voila, you've got a complete Amiga version and Atari ST. And you could never tell, I mean, I know that's a sticker up there saying Atari ST, but if I took that off, and it's already started to peel off, you would not know this is an Amiga or Atari ST version. You would not have a clue, because it doesn't say, it doesn't say at the bottom there, that's just the barcode. So, yeah, the Atari ST and the Amiga boxes are exactly the same, same instructions, exactly the same screenshots on the back, no differences whatsoever. So it's a good way to save money. It's a good way to save money. Just download, if you've got the ability to, with like the ADF ability on, on my Amiga 600 at least. And yeah, just download the ROM onto a blank disc, and then you've got a complete ST and Amiga version. Yeah, Wings of Death is basically a top-down shooter. Again, some screenshots on the, uh, on the screen for you to look at. And the music's really good. Now, one of the big problems that the Amiga, or the Atari ST has got over the Amiga is the sound. We all know the sound is nowhere near, and that's an understatement, as good as the Amiga version. But sometimes, including this one, you know, the Atari ST does have digitised music. It does have digitised sound. It just wasn't implemented enough. And I think it's basically because the developers couldn't be bothered or they weren't as skilled as others. So you just usually had that kind of blip blip sound on the Atari ST, which wasn't very good. But things like Gods, Magic Pockets, uh, Xenon 2, kind of Bitmap Brothers stuff especially, they all had digitised music and sound effects. You know, so really, when it came to like the skilled developers, they proved that you can get that on the Atari ST. Not as good as the Amiga, um, but yeah, maybe as well because the, there wasn't as much memory 
maybe the, de the other developers couldn't squeeze it in and instead they concentrated on putting in extra detail in the graphics. And maybe that's more what it was. But you could get digitized music on the Atari ST. It happened a lot. It'll ha it happened a lot more than people think. They just presume all ST sound is rubbish uh, or the sound on games is rubbish. And it's not the case. Most of the time, yes. But I'd say a good, a good 25% of the time, the music was fine. Not too dissimilar to the Amiga. But anyway, I'm, I'm still envious and jealous all these, and angry, bitter, all these years later. But yes, it's a really good, really good game. There's a sequel as well, I think it's called Lethal Excess, something like that. Um, I'm going to have to check that out. Now, this wasn't cheap when I picked this up, it was around about 55 quid, but it's quite an uncommon game. And every now and again, just out of curiosity, I will have a look on eBay. And since I bought this, and it was a good few months ago now, since I bought it, I've not seen another one become available. So yeah, it's really good. And maybe another reason why the, um, the ST sound is good is because this has been enhanced for the Atari STE. E standing for enhanced. That's the one I've got, the STE up there. So yeah, maybe if you put these discs into a standard Atari ST, maybe the music isn't as good. But the STE in particular, uh, that particular model which came out in 1990, 91, that was definitely the best ST to get up until the Falcon, which arrived way, way, way too late, which was better than the Amiga. It really was, believe it or not, but it arrived too late and, and too expensive. But that's a video for another day. And I guess the last thing I want to talk about before I move on to, there's a few questions, uh, is movies. What have I been watching lately? So there's a couple. The first one I've been watching, uh, this was a few weeks ago, Star Wars The Last Jedi. Now I mentioned this on Twitter, that social media had decided a long, long time ago that The Last Jedi is rubbish. That's the general impression I got from reading tweets and seeing a few YouTube vids. People absolutely mental, going mental uh, at the director and saying that the movie's rubbish and it's the worst Star Wars movie ever and all that kind of stuff. Now, for me, it was curious because the same people tended to say the same thing about The Force Awakens and especially Rogue One. And for me, I liked both of those movies. I thought they're like a seven or eight out of 10. I like them. They're not perfect, obviously hence getting 7 or 8 out of 10 for me, but they're decent. I enjoyed them a lot more as well than I thought I would. So I put The Last Jedi on uh, a week or two ago, and I sat down, watched it, and I've got to be honest, the first few minutes, whatever it was, I thought, my God, this is dreadful. Just on the few minutes, the first few minutes. Because what happened so early into the movie, and as I say, it must have been a few minutes into it, you had this scene between Poe Dameron and General Hux, and they were basically on different ships and they were talking on the, um, via the, what the hell do you call it? Like the equivalent of like a walkie-talkie, so old school. Talking via the, the, head, the headset, whatever, you know what I mean. They were talking. And basically, um, Poe Dameron was stalling, trying to buy some time to do what he kind of had to do. So what he did, he'd, be, he'd let General Hux say his piece and then he'd pretend he couldn't hear him, even though he could. So then General Hux had to say it again. And it went back and forth and it just wasn't funny. Now, it could have been funny if they'd have put it on maybe 30 minutes or an hour into the movie and shortened it. But that was also the problem. It went on too long. It wasn't just a short little gag. It went on for the best part of what felt like a minute. And it just was like, my God, this is poor. I was really disappointed with it. I thought, this is, this is not working. And it was right at the start of the movie. Didn't like it whatsoever. Um, so once that scene was over, it, it got a little bit better. With that said, well, it got a lot better, actually. But with that said, there was a lot of other things which I did not like. There was the, the layer with doing that Superman move, um, which just didn't work. It was a bit tacky. It just looked a little bit silly. Um, as a result of that explosion, which plunged Leia into space before she did her Superman move, there was Admiral Akbar who died on that explosion. But there was no real big deal made of it. It was just thrown into a conversation in the movie, maybe five minutes later, where they're all kind of sat around or stood around and someone was like, oh, and by the way, uh, Admiral Akbar died. And it was like, is that it? Now, Admiral Akbar goes back to the start of Star Wars. He's never really had a lot to say, but I think he is kind of a much loved character. He's been there since the beginning. So to kill him off just like that, without a proper even send off, and then just to, because you didn't even see it happen. I'd have to watch it back, but I don't think I saw him actually die in it. Maybe you did, I'm not sure. It seemed to happen quite quickly. Um, but it was just a really poor way to treat a character. You didn't have to do that. 
you know, it, it just didn't need to be done. I thought it was completely unnecessary. There was the other scene with Luke where he was milking that alien and drinking its green milk, essentially. And I thought that was really poor and tacky, childish, and above all, pointless. There was no need for that whatsoever. Uh, it was just a really silly thing to put in there. There was a strange relationship which blossomed, which I did not see happening, between Finn and Rose, where she kissed him before she kind of passed out, after saving him, um, when she crashed into his ship deliberately to stop him killing himself, essentially. And but So that was weird. I didn't see that happening at all. Now, what I think is going on with that, I think maybe, well, evidently, she likes him romantically, but I don't think he likes her romantically. It just seemed to happen from nowhere. It was There wasn't a backstory put in place where you could tell that they were going to like each other or even her like him. It, it just seemed to happen so quickly. And right at the end of the movie, or towards the end anyway, you see Finn tucking in, um, or, or tucking Rose in, like with the blanket, putting her uh, over because she's like recovering. And you see Ray look over and she looks a little bit like kind of jealous. So I still think that's going to happen eventually. Finn and Ray will probably have a relationship going forward. Uh, maybe that's like why you put that um, Ryan, whatever his name is, a director. Maybe you put that in. That's why you put it in, I should say, at the end of the vid. So she's jealous and to keep that kind of uh, relationship uh, potential kind of, you know, clinging over till the next movie. So, yeah, it was just weird how that happened. If they're going to have some kind of relationship, uh, uh, Finn, uh, sorry, Rose and Finn, or at least if she likes him, that's fine. Obviously, put it into the story, but elaborate on it a little bit more. It just seems to happen from nowhere. And it's uh, also with Kylo Ren. It's like they can't decide what to do with this character. You know, we all know he's kind of starts off like a normal kind of goodish kid, and then he turns to the dark side. But he's got the light side still in him, quite a lot of it as well. But the last movie, Force Awakens, the Force Awakens, and the, this one with the Last Jedi, it's this. It's the same story. He's having this struggle between the dark side and the light side, and he's doing bad things, then he's doing good things, and it's like, it's make your mind up. What are you doing with this character? Because the more he has the light side in him, the weaker he seems as a character. And it's already, for me, at the point where it's very, very difficult to see Kylo Ren becoming a real bad guy in the Star Wars universe. There's too much good, there's too much light side in him forever for him to ever be really, really bad. So maybe for the rest of time, for the rest of the Star Wars universe, he's always going to be someone who kind of bounces back and forth. Uh, that's what it seems to me. He's done too many bad things to be a full-on, you know, good guy. And he's done too many good things to be a full-on bad guy. So they've, they've deliberately kind of spoiled that, really. So that what they need to do, is it J.J. Abrams is back for the next one? What he really needs to do, like he needs tips from me, he really needs to, well, evidently he does, what he really needs to do is to... Decide once and for all, where are you going with this character and make it work? Because as a character, I do quite like him. It's just they, they haven't decided what to do with him. At least in my opinion. So yeah, but overall, those ridiculous issues aside, I did like it. And I would, again, give it a 7 or an 8 out of 10. I know not everybody did like it, clearly. But, but I did, so that's that. And then the other thing I've been watching, and I just watched this a couple of nights ago. And uh, I've got a physical version of this to show. Um, because I downloaded or streamed The um, Last Jedi. Kindergarten Cop. You can even see that because of the light. Uh, Kindergarten Cop with Arnold Schwarzenegger from 1990. Now, I remember so vividly renting the VHS in... Was it 91? I think it was 91, actually, wasn't it? No, 1990. I think I read the other day that it came out Christmas time, there or thereabouts, in America at the cinema. And I think it was January, February time. 1991 it came out of the cinema in the UK so by the time it came to VHS it probably would have been late 1991 but either way I remember vividly going down and renting that from the the VHS video rental shop uh, where we used to live and um, we specifically sought that one out we really wanted to watch it we knew it was coming out on VHS and we got it and we loved it now I've not seen Kindergarten Cop since 1991 late 1991 until well, two nights ago and um, I love it. It's brilliant. It is a really good movie. Again, I don't know what most people think. I had a quick look online on, on Twitter and YouTube and the reviews and opinions were mixed. Like everything in this day and age. Um, social media. Some people love something. Some people hate it. It's just opinions are all across the board, aren't they? But I thought it was really, really good. 
basically the basic premise of it is you've got Arnie who plays this cop called John Kimball and he goes undercover and basically he's been after this guy he's been chasing him he's been watching him for like the past four years he's called Cullen Crisp I nearly said Quentin Crisp there Quentin Crisp is someone entirely different so yeah Cullen Crisp and John Kimball Arnie has been watching this guy he's been like um, he's a bad guy for a start he's like uh, he's dealing in drugs and all that kind of stuff now um, what uh, John not John Cullen um, Cullen Crisp, the bad guy, what he is doing, he's trying to find his kid. His wife ran away with his kid because he's a bad guy. They want to get away from him. He's dangerous and all that kind of stuff. And they ran away to um, Oregon, uh, which is the state kind of what's well, above California. And um, this news gets out to John Kimball, Arnie, who obviously wants to track him down. He wants to keep the, um, the family safe, even though he doesn't know them. He's got to figure out who the family are and... Um, and protect them from this bad guy, arrest the bad guy, save the day kind of thing. So what he does, Arnold, John Kimball, with his assistant, Phoebe O'Hara, they travel up to Oregon and what Phoebe, his partner, they're both underco undercover detectives, what his partner is going to do is she's going to be the substitute teacher and he's just going to kind of keep an eye around the town and all that kind of stuff. But on the way there, she gets sick. Like, I don't know if it's like a food poisoning or whatever it is. So she can't go to school and be the substitute teacher. So Arnie has to go in because she's just too sick to go in the next day. So Arnie becomes a teacher and it's it, like chaos ensues because he's not used to it. He's never been a teacher before. The substitute, what would have been the substitute teacher, Phoebe, his police sidekick, she used to be a teacher before she became a policeman. So she would have taken to it like a duck to water. It would have been easy for her, but he's never done it before. He's a cop and he can't control the kids. They're causing mayhem and all that kind of stuff. And eventually... He kind of gets them all under control. They get to like him. He gets to like working there and all that kind of stuff. Now, it ha as it happens, the kid is in his class and the substitute or what, another one of the teachers at the school that he's working at is the mother. Uh, so it's the mother and the kid at the school that he's trying to protect. So he kind of falls for her. You know, they get kind of romantically involved. Then he figures out that, you know, these are the people that he's got to try and protect. So eventually, long story short, he, um, he tells him, look, I'm a cop, and then she feels a bit betrayed because she thought he was a teacher. Also, she's afraid and annoyed that he knows about her past and that she's on the run. But he says, look, you know, everything's going to be fine. I'm going to protect you. This, the bad guy, uh, Colin Crisp, he goes up there and um, tries to get his kid back, captures him or kidnaps him briefly, sets the school on fire, which is a little bit kind of dark, but everyone's fine. And then at the end of the day, Arnie, well, he saves the day, of course. So um, that's a real kind of crash course and a bad one at that into how the, the movie kind of uh, pans out. But it's funny because I think it was a PG. It doesn't actually have a rating on here, but I think it was a PG rating. But it is actually quite dark. There's a lot of dark stuff in there. You do see some pretty, well, albeit minor, but still minor gruesome stuff for a PG. You're like, bloody hell. And it just reminds you that it's... You know, movies like that back in the day, in the 80s and right at the turn of the 90s, they were quite violent in parts, but they had that kind of comical edge. They were a family movie, which it still kind of is, a family kind of comedy movie, an action comedy, but with dark things in there. Like Beverly Hills Cop was a little bit gruesome as well, but it was kind of funny. And in a way, it is a family movie. And this is the same kind of thing. So yeah, I really like it, I've got to be honest. Um, it takes me back. It's my kind of era, my childhood nostalgia, the late 80s, the early kind of 90s. It's my kind of thing. Now, the picture quality isn't great. You can really tell it's going back to 1990. Uh, maybe a Blu-ray, an updated Blu-ray release. Uh, maybe they could kind of uh, make it look very, very modern. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert when it comes to, uh, you know, all that kind of picture quality. But I've got to be honest, for me, Kindergarten Cop is a really good movie. Uh, cheesy, uh, somewhat kind of predictable. But quite heartwarming as well and yeah i just i really like it it's 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 really good i'm sure you've seen it um if not you've got to watch it but it is cheesy but it's great in my opinion well i say great it's it's good <laughs> so let's move on to the questions we'll try and wrap this video up pretty quickly it's going to be less than two hours now there's not many questions i think this is partially my fault for having that previous friday brew up for 24 hours and then pulling it and then putting it back live or making it live again like a week later. But by which time it would have been lost in people's feeds. So, um, yeah, please, if you've got any questions for next week or the week after, whenever I do it, uh, please feel free to ask. If not, 
don't worry about it because here's an idea I've got which may work better than questions. I'm just thinking of basically going down the comment section and if someone makes an interesting point, then maybe talk about it. Maybe that's an alternative. And maybe that makes everybody that little bit more involved. Because obviously if you want to ask a question, you've got to specifically ask something. Um, whereas if you leave a comment, then I may, depending on what you say, uh, I may mention it and I can involve other people who maybe ordinarily wouldn't have asked the question. So maybe that's a good way to go forward. Um, first set of questions are from Clay Graphics. So thank you, Clayton. There's seven altogether, but they're kind of quick fire. So Final Fight or Streets of Rage? So I'm going to go with Final Fight. Um, it's actually, again, speaking of the ST, it came with my ST. It's one of the games that came with it. And uh, so I absolutely love it. So Streets of Rage is a brilliant game. The franchise is really good. Uh, but for me, I'm going to have to say Final Fight. I just think it's a better game for me. Uh, I've got more nostalgia for it, not just with the ST, but also on the SNES, but also on the arcades. I used to play on the arcade. So, Final Fight. Question number two, Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat? Street Fighter, 100%. I was a big Mortal Kombat fan. I really do like it. But yeah, it's going to have to be Street Fighter. Unless you were deviously suggesting the first Street Fighter and the first Mortal Kombat, in which case I'll have a different answer. But Street Fighter 2 absolutely amazing so yeah i'll say street fighter for that one shinobi or ninja gaiden 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 um shinobi again uh, nostalgia i remember playing shinobi on the amstrad on the st on the amiga on the mega drive uh with ninja gaiden i the only time i played it i think was on a ps3 Atari st or amiga and then in brackets ouch this is no doubt going to be difficult but yeah really really difficult you'll see you always see it the amiga 600 set up there the Atari ST, I've mentioned that a hundred times in this vid. Um, oh, you swine. That's a tough one, Clay. Um, listen, the Amiga is better in terms of what it can do. It may not be your or someone else's preference, um, but your preference is, is completely different arguments. Um, so the Amiga is better, but... Oh. See, here's the thing. Because of what I said before about, you know, when I... Frankenstein games together and I buy the ST version usually and then copy the Amiga, uh, the Amiga disc and put it in here to make a complete Amiga version. By doing that what it means is I get to play both versions and when I do that with some games I can see at first hand how much better 90% of the time, not always, hence 90, but 90% of the time the Amiga version is, is definitely better. Um, so if I was to get rid of say the Amiga and just have the ST I would miss the Amiga because most of the games are better, better music, better scrolling, um, better graphics in most part. I mean, they kind of look pretty much identical, but some levels have more detail and more things to it on the Amiga version. So it's a tough one. The Amiga is better, but the ST is more nostalgic. So you could literally just toss a coin on this one. Um, I, I would just feel a real Judas if I didn't say the ST. So I'll say the ST could be the Amiga as well. Um, but we'll go with ST. Ask me this question next week and I'll, I'll say the Amiga. Question number five, Michael Jackson or Prince? Michael Jackson. Yeah, I mean, I like Prince's big hits. Uh, most of us do, they're, they're good songs. Uh, but Michael Jackson for me, not just more of a character, um, just a bigger artist. I mean, Prince was big as well, but yeah, Michael Jackson. Uh, more interest in the character, uh, that's an understatement. And just the songs were better and more nostalgic. So that again plays a part. Cats or dogs? I'm going to have to say cats. Um, I've been more used to cats. We've got a cat and um, I've never had a dog. I've never had it. I've been around them uh, with family members. Uh, family members not being dogs themselves, of course. <laughs> but um, with family members having dogs. And yeah, they're cute and all the rest of it. And they're more intelligent, well, in their own way. Maybe not more intelligent, actually. Maybe more uh, personable. They relate more to humans I think than cats do that you know you can tell them to do things and they'll do it cats just they do it if they want <laughs> you know so um but they're both kind of cute I am I do like them both but I will say cats tea or coffee tea absolutely tea yeah I've never really I've never really been a, a coffee drinker I'll have one every now and again I mean for me I tend to have a coffee maybe on like a Sunday morning if I get up early really early and it just kind of it gives me that spring of my step to start the day. But I very, very seldom have it during the week. 
um, very, even rarer, even more seldom do I have it in the evening. Um, yeah, it's like a Sunday morning. And uh, maybe that's a should be a future um, video title, like the Sunday morning coffee. Maybe I could do that. So yeah, tea, without question. Next set of questions are from Steve, Addy Sneaker Freak. Thank you, Steve. What food or snacks do you miss from the UK? Well, when it comes to snacks, I mean, I could be specific and give you a load of brands, but really, if truth be told, we've got the same things here. They're just called something else. They may taste slightly different, but it's the same thing. So I don't really miss any snacks. And a lot of things you can buy uh, over here, quite frankly, and especially in this day and age of just importing them. There's a shop actually not too far away, maybe about an hour away in a little tiny town. And it's an import shop. And they sell things like salad cream, and brown sauce, uh, HP sauce, and all that kind of Heinz baked beans, and all that kind of stuff. It's a bit too far, well, an hour and a bit, I guess, to travel regularly for me. Um, but, and, and like I say, with the internet, you can just order it and get it delivered. But I don't really tend to do that. Um, but yeah, so I can get it if I want it. Also, about, I've just uh, remembered actually, um, I'd say probably about four years ago, four or five years ago, there was a YouTuber. Oh my god, what's his name? How about um, Craig? Craig's here again, and Craig's Craig's not here anymore on my channel. He's still on YouTube. I don't know where Craig went. Actually, he used to comment all the time, and then he just stopped. He's still around because I still see him commenting. I mean, no hard feelings. He'll have his reasons, I guess. But Craig sent me um, a PS3 game about four years ago, and then he um, he also sent me. I think it was Craig. He sent me some like sachets, like a handful of sachets of salad cream, which I think his wife or his girlfriend had got from like the local fish and chip shop or cafe or somewhere. So that was quite nice. But yeah, Craig, I've forgotten about him. I, I don't know where he went. Maybe I said something or did something. Maybe he's a Man United fan. Maybe that's what he, and I said something bad about United. And in fact, actually thinking about it, a, a local, a much more local kind of mini grocery store, there's a little import section and they've got a few British things. There's not a lot, but there's a few things there. So yes, I don't really miss too much because I can get it. So it's not a big deal. Um, and, but to give you one example, though, of something which I can't get here, not technically, um, not as good, fish and chips. Fish and chips from a fish and chip shop, from a proper chippy, uh, in that polystyrene kind of carton that will come in, or in newspaper, uh, with battered sausage as well. Oh, bloody hell. You definitely can't get that here. I've not seen it. Uh, not even in, like, um, San Francisco. Um, I'm sure they've got them somewhere. But it's not the same. You know, with the salt and vinegar, drenching it in salt and vinegar. Oh, I can I can smell it, that smell, and I can taste it. I'd love to have that. So that's the one thing that springs to mind that I really miss. And also maybe a good curry as well. You know, in the UK, um, it's kind of very kind of the emphasis when it comes to foreign food. Or the Indian food is a big thing for obvious reasons with the influx of, of uh, Indians in the UK in like the 70s and in the 80s. So uh, the Indian dish in the UK is, is massively popular. Uh, whereas over here, what we've got, is um, Mexican food, so um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. So I do miss I do miss the curry, but fish and chips is is the big one. Question number two on the reverse: What food snacks did you discover and like in the U.S.? Well, let's go with Mexican then. Yeah, Mexican uh, Mexican food is massive in well, I don't know about America, but it is in California for obvious geographical reasons, um, sharing a border with Mexico and all the rest of it. A lot of Mexican ne uh, Mexican people around. There's a lot of signposts in Spanish and on the bus. I hardly, I think the last time I went on the bus was about a year ago. But I remember seeing, maybe even longer than that, but I remember seeing um, it on the, I don't even know why I was on the bus, I don't know what I was doing. But anyway, I was on it and it came up with that the next stop and it was in English and then it was in Spanish. So that was kind of interesting uh, to see. And you do see it here and there uh, on signposts. It's, it's English 99% of the time. But, um, but yeah, so I'd say Mexican food. Now, it's funny because me and my wife went to a Mexican restaurant in the UK, in Bournemouth, in around about 2006, 2007. And um, for anyone who knows where this Mexican restaurant is, it might not even be there because it's over a decade ago now. But it's in the centre of Bournemouth and you've got this clothes shop called Richmond Classics, if it's still there. Quite an expensive clothes store that I used to frequent, like a designer shop. Um, but Admittedly, I used to spend most of my money when they had the sales. I wasn't rich enough to, you know, piss away money um, like a total madman. So, like, I'd buy, like, a Paul Smith 
or a Nicole Fari designer jumper that would have been like 250 quid and they'd have it on sale for like 80. So it's still a lot of money, but I'd be, I'd, so I, and I'd buy them, but when they were on sale, like the jeans would be usually 200 quid, but I'd pick them up for like 70. You know, a waste of money in hindsight, but I was in my late teens and early 20s. So anyway, so opposite Richmond Classics, you've like that's kind of over there, you had or still have this Mexican restaurant. And then what you used to have next door to it, which is probably no longer there, is a news agent. And then right on the corner, literally kind of going around on the side and the following round, you had Burton Menswear, where I used to work, the centre of Bournemouth, I used to work at Burton's for a couple of years. And and that, that now I think is new look. It's no longer Burton's, it's, it's new look. And then if you go a little bit further up, you had, probably not there anymore, Electronics Boutique, uh, the computer game stop, uh, stop, shop, which I used to work at as well for a year or, or whatever it was back in the late 90s. So anyway, so we went, me and my wife, to this Mexican restaurant in Bournemouth 10, 12, 15 years ago. And for me, because I wasn't used to proper Mexican food, it tasted fine. I quite liked it. It was, it might have, it, for all intents and purposes, as far as I was concerned, it was authentic. But for my wife, who obviously growing up in America, she knew it wasn't authentic. She was like, this doesn't taste anything like Mexican food. So, um, but I thought it was. Now coming here, I'm, I'm used to more authentic Mexican food, of course. So it's going to be interesting next time we go back to the UK, tasting Mexican food in the UK and seeing the difference, because I'm sure I recognise it. Um, so, but yeah, so I wasn't used to it at all. I hardly had any Mexican food in the UK. Uh, once in a very, very blue moon, i.e., well, probably once actually, that one time we went to a restaurant, I wasn't into it. But since coming here, having like chimichangas and burritos and even things like, um, what do you call that, like, the crackers, uh, the tortillas with the dip, you know, with the sauce that they've got in there, with like the onion chopped up and all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't have touched it. I wouldn't have touched it at all. But now I love it. I really like it. So that's the answer to the question. That's the food, uh, stroke snack food, that I've discovered since coming to America that I really like. So Mexican food will be up there. Question number three. Besides the stupid gun fascination over there, what do you find to be the biggest differences? Uh, well, I think sport. You know, obviously in the UK, on, on the, the TV, on the in newspapers, you pick a newspaper up on the back and sometimes on the front, football heavy. You know, other sports as well, rugby, cricket, tennis, Wimbledon. Um, but football is the main thing that the nation kind of lives and breathes by uh, when it comes to sports. And over here, when it comes to football or soccer, forget about it. It just doesn't really happen. It is starting to change a little bit. The MLS has definitely made inroads, definitely. Even just the 10 years I've been here, it more people talking about it, more people watching about it, more uh, column space in newspapers, more news on the TV, uh, without question. But it's still very, very much behind American football, behind baseball, behind basketball. So to pick up a newspaper or for the news um, programme to start on the telly or a sports programme, and for football, soccer, to sometimes not even get a mention, but when it does, to be usually kind of shoehorned in towards the end is weird, it's weird to me. It's weird to me sitting down with someone at work or a typical American and for them not to have heard of um, like Lionel Messi or Ronaldo, George Best, Pele. And then the other thing I'd say is the size of the country. The country is massive, it really is. California is enormous. It's bigger than the United Kingdom from Land's End to John O'Groats. California is bigger than the, the whole of the UK. I think people forget that. So traveling long distances in America is not a big deal. When I was living in the UK and let's say Bournemouth, for example, London is around about a couple of hours, an hour, an hour and a half to two hours, something like that. And I used to be like, oh, bloody hell, no way, I'm not going there. But now I did actually quite a lot as it happened, but I would have went a lot more if it was closer. But the fact that it was oh, two hours, Jesus, that's ages. But when you come to America, two hours travel is not a long time. People travel everywhere because they've got no choice, because the country's massive. It's so spread out. So yeah, that's the other thing I'd say. The size of the country uh, is obviously different and people's view when it comes to traveling long distances. In the UK, people don't really want to do it because it's a much smaller country um, and things seem further away. But when you come to America, you, you realize that two hours to get from Bournemouth to London is not a long uh, distance at all. It really isn't. And then last but not least, Steve says, just for fun, your top five Arnie movies. Oh, speaking of the devil, what's the chances of that? 
The top five Arnie movies in reverse order. So I presume you mean from um, best to worst, because it's usually the other way around. So, um, well, obviously, let's start with Kindergarten Cop. So that'll be my best. I absolutely love it. Brilliant movie. So we've got to say Kindergarten Cop. I'm not even joking. Well, I probably am joking, actually, because I've just watched it. It's fresh in the mind. But we'll say Kindergarten Cop. We'll say Terminator 2, which is an amazing movie. So much nostalgia. I'll have to talk about that another time. But yeah, oh, bloody hell. So much nostalgia for that one. I remember where I was when I watched it. But again, that's for another vid. Uh, Total Recall. Again, I've got a story about that, which I'll share another time. That's quite a funny one. Um, so we'll go with that one. Predator. We'll put that one in there. I mean, I do like it, but I think it's one of those movies that everybody says is great. Um, but most people maybe just say it's great when they think it was all right. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe I just think it was all right. I don't think it was great. It was, it was decent. But uh, it wasn't rubbish. I want to make that clear. But I don't know. Uh, I'd probably prefer Predator 2, quite frankly. Um, that's maybe controversial. And then last but not least, just because I watched this at Christmas, I don't know if I even talked about it on a vlog. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Um, Jingle All The Way. <laughs> We're going to go with Jingle All The Way. Yeah, it's not a great movie, but it's a feel-good movie. It's a Christmas movie. I think it came out in 1996. And I didn't actually watch it until last year, Christmas. Uh, I bought the Blu-ray. It was really cheap. It was about 5 or $6. And so I'm going to go with that. So that's my top five. With Kindergarten Cop being the greatest Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Maybe. Maybe not. And then last but not least, we've got a couple of football questions. Don't turn off. From uh, from Damo. Your starting 11 dream team of players from the 90s. Uh, from, from the 90s era. Who played in the top tier. Division 1, then Premier League. When it was introduced. Then your favourite 11 players who never played in England from the same period. So I'll quickly go through these. Let me... Um, scroll down so yeah I've wrote this down before obviously otherwise it'd take ages so my top 11 my first 11 my dream team of players who played in England at least who were at the height of their powers in the 90s uh, so I've had to leave a lot of players out who maybe um, were great in the 80s and decent in the early 90s but then phased out like John Barnes John Barnes was amazing but the 90s weren't really apart from right at the start of the decade they weren't really his best years um, certainly not by the time the, the late 90s finished. So here's my 11. Unfortunately, it's dominated by a lot of Man United players because, let's face it, they had some of the best players. So you've probably done this deliberately, Damo, to make me name United players. Uh, so in goal, Peter Schmeichel. A back four of Dennis Irwin, Stuart Pearce, Tony Adams and Steve Bruce. Steve Bruce wasn't a great defender, but he was. Um, his leadership skills were great and he scored a lot of goals. Uh, in midfield, we've got Roy Keane, just for the, the strength and the intimidation. Matthew Letizia for the skill and the flair. David Beckham for the creativity and the free kicks. Ryan Giggs, again, with the speed and the dribbling skills, creativity. And up front, Alan Shearer and Eric Cantona. I don't think you can beat that team, quite frankly. I nearly put in Georgie King Clancy from City. But uh, really, he just had one season, didn't he, with, uh, with City in the Premier League. So... And it wasn't a very good one. Well, it was for him personally, but the club were relegated, so that was rubbish. Um, but he was a brilliant player. But and then players who have never played in England during the 90s. Again, I kind of used players who were at the peak of their powers in the 90s. So I didn't include Maradona. Even though he retired in 97, um, he was suspended for two or three of those years with drug abuse and all that kind of stuff. Really, when you think of Maradona, you think late 80s, very early 90s. Uh, so he's not in there. Uh, along with a number of other players. But here's my uh, starting eleven: Oliver Kahn in goal. In defence, we've got Ronald Koeman, free kick, scored a lot. Roberto Carlos, scored a lot of goals. Uh, Paolo Maldini and Franco Baresi. Uh, just, you're just not going to concede any goals with them two at the back. Uh, Lothar Matthäus, uh, the German captain, was brilliant in midfield. Along with Michael Laudrup, a Danish player, who was, again, a very elegant player. Uh, on the wings, but they will cut in. Uh, we've got Zinedine Zidane and Ronaldinho. And up front, Ronaldo, the original Brazilian one, and Roberto Baggio. I nearly went for Batistuta, but really, could you put Batistuta ahead of Ronaldo and Baggio? Probably not. So, yeah, sport for choice there. Um, some other good players um, I was thinking of putting in, like Georgi Haji, uh, Haristo Stoichkov, but they didn't make it. So I think that's two pretty good teams there. Um, and if they played each other, that would be, bloody hell, that would be a good game. I don't know who would win. It would just be nil-nil. Um, or 100-100, or who knows. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. That ties up another vid. Bit of an abrupt ending there.
thank you very much for watching just thrown in um so yeah I, i'll be back soon i do keep hinting at the fact that i have got a pickups video to make i may do that soon i may not um we'll see videos as and when and uh, yeah until my next video thank you for watching and i'll see you later